Hello and welcome to the Tekken Sports Podcast. Tekken Sports is a show about how technology is revolutionizing all the major sports, as well as health and fitness. You can find it on your podcast service of choice. My name is Alex Koop, and I am here with the coolest person ever, Mandy Kovacs. Hi, thank you. I appreciate that. I know. <laughs> That's great, uh, because this week Mandy spoke with Trisha Dugan, the Vice President and Head of Immersive Computing at HP, about how 3D printing can change the sports clothing industry, plus all your latest sports tech news, new apps and wearables, and your weekly concussion update. But before we get to that, we would really appreciate it if you would review and rate Tech and Sports Podcast. We've been growing the show for the last few months, and we really, really appreciate all the support so far. And with that, sit back and relax because the Tekken Sports crew is entering the game. All right, so we're starting off with a lot of World Cup stories today because it's really the only news that's out right now. Uh, We've had our first few looks at video replay at the World Cup, and it hasn't disappointed too much so far. It's been used quite a number of times now. Um, and at least six or seven times throughout the tournament. I won't obviously get into all of them, but I wanted to give a quick recap of at least some of them and, and some of the controversies that have happened. So first, it was used last Saturday in a game between France and Australia, and the French side was given a penalty kick in the 58th minute that eventually turned into a goal after the video after sorry after the referee used video review to check out a potential foul, and then they also used goal line technology uh, to confirm that the ball had crossed the line after bouncing off the crossbar in the 81st minute. The French have always been a little skeptical of video review and actually wanted to be removed from some of the French leagues um, back in France, but they seem to have acknowledged that this was the right use of the technology uh, in this scenario, so hey, maybe they're warming up to it. Uh, Video replay was also used in the next game between Sweden and South Korea, where the Tech awarded Sweden a penalty kick, which the team then used to win the match 1-0. Then in Egypt versus Russia, Mohamed Salah was hauled down to the ground by a Russian player and was awarded a penalty kick that again resulted in a goal thanks to the review. Uh, And in the Iran-Spain match, a video review called back Iran's equalizing goal. And while all hell broke loose, the tech definitely made the right call. The call, the, the, sorry, the ball did not cross the line. But there are also some teams that are complaining that uh, video re- review hasn't been used properly. So during the England Tunisia match last week, English attacker Henry Kane was rustled down to the ground twice, and despite being looked at by the reviews with video re- replay, nothing was actually called. Kane did eventually score the game winner, uh, which he called justice for the missed calls. And the same thing happened in. Brazil's draw was Switzerland on Sunday. Brazilian defender Miranda was pushed and their goalie was apparently manhandled inside the penalty area and still there was no video review for either of these plays and the team is considering a formal complaint to FIFA because they think that those two incidents were enough to hinder their game and the reason that they only drawed they didn't actually win. Um, But video review did also help in the Peru versus France match, where it helped the referee award a yellow card to the right player after initially getting it wrong. So the verdict is still kind of out, but video replay does seem to be working pretty well, and most players seem to have acknowledged that it's helping their game. Yeah, the goal line review stuff is a huge huge plus and and has certainly helped make the right calls when it comes to whether Mm -hmm. the ball crossed the line or not, but... Man, I, I don't really feel like I, I've watched a few games. Not certainly not all of them, but I don't really feel like it's made a huge difference. Yeah. Uh, so far from what I've seen, and and some of the the diving that's still happening, <laughs> I don't really know how much replays can can improve the mm-hmm. the number of diving or like help reduce the number of diving that's taking place. Because like in my head, I just imagine like. A referee running down the field, seeing a player fall down, and then like in their earpiece from like the control center being like, "Nope, that's a diving call. Like, let that go." Right. But I, we're obviously not there yet. Maybe we'll never get there. But I just, <laughs> I just wish somehow this new tech would sort of help clean that up because that is mm-hmm. still by far the most frustrating thing to to that's see in awkward. a game. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think it's certainly getting some calls right and and proving sort of the accuracy of stuff. But at the same time. I mean, like you mentioned in that that uh, uh, that English uh, Tunisia uh, game, Tunisia game, and and Henry Kane like was yeah. definitely 
Yeah, that was, call was definitely goofed up. So. It was missed completely. <laughs> yeah, so I, I do agree that it needs <clears throat> it has a ways to go still, but it's at least made a difference in some games for better or for worse, depending on who you're cheering for. Yeah, I think it just ultimately has to be used a bit more to mm-hmm. sort of see exactly what kind of effect it has. Agreed. Yeah. Okay, next up, apparently the English team is wearing battery-powered heated pants throughout the World Cup to combat injury-threatening changes in temperature. So the team says that this is how it's coping with the Russian climate after training in 12 degrees Celsius heat, but then moving on to another city to play a different game in 30 degree heat. So the range is quite uh, significant, and that's why they're wearing these pants. And the pants were developed by a company called Lizard Heat, which received funding from Dragon's Den back in 2012. And the tech is all based on infrared technology research by Loughborough University in England. They keep the player's leg muscles at a steady temperature during rest periods to reduce the likely of a pull, tear, or strain. And they're starting to gain in popularity as well, because apparently back in the English Premier League, Manchester United, Everton, Swansea, and Leeds have all ordered uh, these pants for their players for next season. So you might see it outside of the World Cup. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, maybe some, maybe the TFC should adopt uh, some <laughs> of that as well, because... We have some cold weather here sometimes that they... That they some find. cold weather. <laughs> we live in Canada, yes. We are always in an Arctic type that's of right. climate. <laughs> Just kidding, guys. That's not actually real. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> and next, apparently, FIFA has given all 32 teams at the World Cup their own tablet to see statistics and in-game data on players and the ball. So the balls during the tournament, if you recall, have tracking chips inside of them. And the tablet will give that information as well as other information from two optical tracking cameras uh, to these tablets that all the teams have. And the teams actually get two tablets, one for the sideline coaches and another for their analysts that are watching from the media area. So they get all this processed data as well as live footage so that they can analyze things like pair, player metrics and review plays later on. So all this information can be used for analyzing during halftime in the locker room as well. And all teams are getting post-match analysis uh, feedback from the league itself. So FIFA says that they're doing this to even the playing field so that every team, even the ones without a lot of resources, can have the chance to use tech and compete with others that do have some of those resources. That's cool. That's a lot of that's a lot of tablets being handed out. Yes, it is. Yeah, so thirty two <laughs> times two, <laughs> sixty four. Yep, that's a lot. Yeah, I, I would have expected it. Maybe some of these teams are bringing their own tablets in, but I was just wondering, like, why why is everyone every team getting a tablet if if they're bringing their own? Which I was mm-hmm. assuming they are. You know, in this day and age, I would assume most teams kind of bring their own tablets and stat mm-hmm. tracking gear, but. Well like, I, well, like they said, I think it's trying to even the playing field, but you're right. Yeah. Most teams, I would assume, bring their own technology. Um, but I think it's for just the smaller teams, maybe like some of the smaller African countries or even some of the smaller uh, South American teams. Maybe they need those. Maybe they don't have enough of the resources. Yeah, maybe. And then maybe these tablets are the only ones that actually connect to the stat tracking that's in the that's ball. possible. So it could be that. a security thing, too. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Next, we have news that the Dallas Cowboys have opened up a new sports therapy complex and community health facility in partnership with healthcare provider Baylor Scott and White Health. The facility is situated within the Cowboys' campus in Dallas and will not only provide health care for players and the staff, but also for recreational and amateur athletes in the area. It'll teach visitors about the science of athleticism as well, and it'll have a strength training room inside, as well as basketball courts and a retractable dome that can be used as an indoor or outdoor field. And some of the walls inside are actually see-through, so uh, everyone can observe different parts of the rehabilitation process. And next, I wanted to talk about a study done in Regina, Saskatchewan, about how sports can unite people, or maybe not. Katie Savinson, she's a PhD candidate at the school, studied almost a million Twitter interactions that mentioned the Blue Jays during their incredible playoff runs in 2015 and 2016. So the Toronto slogan was come together in the first year and let's rise the second year. But this researcher found that in reality, fans of the team were actually really negative. They created their own hierarchies based on knowledge, behaviors, or commitment to the team. And so Katie is actually a self-professed Green Bay Packers fan and started her research after being yelled at on the streets in Seattle for wearing a Packers jersey. So she said that she's always known that there's going to be chirps and barbs um, traded between opposing fans. That's always been a thing. Fans are always going to hate other fans, you know. Uh, so she decided to focus instead on the relationship of fans of the same team on social media and has essentially 
essentially found that sports aren't as unifying as we thought. So she found that fans of the Jays were actually part of a culture prone to exclusion. So the vast majority seemed peaceful and positive, uh, but they would often criticize other fans that tweeted negatively about the team, or they may not have seemed that they knew enough about the team, or even fans that started the wave. They were prone to a lot of hate uh, because a lot of fans don't like starting the wave at games. Um, and so I think that this is really super interesting research because, I mean, I've experienced it myself. I mean, I got yelled at at the streets in Montreal wearing my Leafs jersey when I was only 14, um, which, I mean, is not great. You should never yell at someone on the street just for what they're wearing. But, I mean, I can at least kind of expect that because the Habs and the Leafs have a very long rivalry. <laughs> but, I mean, when I tweet about the Jays, when I tweet about the Leafs, when I tweet about different sports, like sometimes... You even get attacked by your own fans, you know, for not having a valid point of view or whatever. So I definitely see that this research makes sense. Very interesting Mm -hmm. research, but none of this is a a surprise. No, exactly. (laughs) Are you telling me that sports fans and Toronto Blue Jays fans in particular can be jerks sometimes? (laughs) Sometimes. That's a shocker to me. I know. Oh, gosh, yeah. Um, (laughs) Riveting stuff here. (laughs) But it it is an interesting look at sort of fan behavior online and and this is a bit of a new take when it comes to like fan interactions among like fans of the same Mm -hmm. team so yeah that that angle is cool but not the most surprising no i mean if anything it's just proof right like it just reaffirms our thoughts that sports fans suck for the most part (laughs) like some of us are really nice and that's great but The rest of us are kind of mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wonder what'll happen when we eventually win a World Series or a Stanley Cup. Oh my How, god. Will will we unite and celebrate and not destroy the city or will we turn into a post-apocalyptic world? Like once? I genuinely <laughs> think if the Leafs ever won the cup like this city might burn down. Yep. Just out of like sheer happiness. No one just cares about anything else <laughs> anymore. <laughs> ha- happiness, cha- chaotic happiness. Yes. Yeah. You heard it here first. That's if right. it does happen, we predicted it. <laughs> All right, and our last story of the day. Uh, We have a really cool feel-good story uh, also about the Blue Jays, so don't think too badly of Toronto fans now. The Blue Jays have an after-school program for vulnerable youth as part of their community charity work. And this week, or sorry, I guess last week, Acer gave the foundation 20 new laptops to show their support for it. So Acer signed on as a Jays Care Foundation partner in 2014, and this is just kind of the next step in in helping after-school programs um, take kids off the streets. Awesome. That's a great, great initiative. Sometimes sports can actually do some amazing things. That's true. I take it back. Maybe sports fans are actually good. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, that's it for news for the week. Yeah. And on to new apps and wearables. Uh, So we're going to start off with a little uh, story about some uh, smart insoles so of course ai is going to help athletes improve their form while running of course Um, it's going to help people do a whole bunch of stuff but in this case um runvi a kickstarter backed uh, company is hoping to do uh, is hoping to improve athletes form while running through an ios app um, complete with apple watch apple watch support so uh, basically this app uh, basically, this product is a uh, you, it's a unique smart insole that's equipped with 30 different uh, advanced pressure sensors and two ex- accelerometers, and these uh, fit snugly into your shoe, or so they say, and it collects um, accurate representation of an athlete's form while running. And so this uh, quote-unquote digital coach, um, it, it tracks uh, the data, which is then analyzed by AI to produce real-time feedback to the runner. And you take that info and you sort of make the appropriate adjustments to to run a little better. Mm. Uh, obviously, people have different styles of running. Um, so, yeah, this could certainly provide some some great feedback for people and actually create interesting results. And if you go to their website, it's got some pretty um, pretty good support from athletes and, and coaches. Mm. Uh, but with like all crowdfunded campaigns look into it a little more if like you're seriously interested in it Um, but it seems like this is actually uh, something that could you know make a significant difference and actually do what it's advertised to do yeah this actually sounds pretty interesting i mean if you already have 
um, like a smartwatch or some sort of fitness tracker. I, I don't think that there's a point to this because, I mean, that can track your acceleration and stuff too. Maybe not necessarily your running form, but a lot of people don't want to have so many tracking things on them. Yeah, that, that's true. It would true. depend, yeah. This is like very specific to running. So like if I imagine if you're putting too much pressure, like if you're you're while you're running, you're putting too much pressure on your toes or, mm -hmm. or you're kind of like putting too much pressure on your heels or just running awkwardly like that that's what this will pick up specifically so if that's your it's, thing and yeah. like you really want to improve your your running form specifically like this is for you <laughs> actually i've have a, i have always wondered what my running form is like because i do feel like i put too much pressure on one leg and i've always mm -hmm. wondered if that i'm just being crazy or if yeah. that's an actual thing uh, so, that, yeah. that's another good point maybe yeah, we'll I'm, test it out and get back to everyone yeah absolutely <laughs> And uh, moving on, um, Cristiano Ronaldo, who is quickly making a case for the uh, greatest soccer player of the current generation. The or... GOAT! <laughs> yeah. um, he's become Sleep Score Lab's latest brand ambassador. Um, the Sleep Score mobile app launched June 12th. It uses sleep sensing sonar tech and algorithms developed by ResMed, uh, which is a, a leader in sleep medical, medical devices. And we've talked about this before a little bit. Uh, the tech has been tested and validated at uh, various accredited sleep labs worldwide. And it's now available to anyone with a smartphone. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's great that they have a, a new brand ambassador. Ronaldo is, mm -hmm. is huge right now. And sleep is very important. So Yeah, I think uh, the last time we covered them, they partnered with the NBA. That's right. right? Yeah. 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 So everyone in the NBA got smart beds. That's yeah. not fair. <laughs> <laughs> Why can't I get one? I know. But, uh, so, yeah, if... If that interests you, you should check it out. And Ronaldo is, uh, you know, he's got a, he's a pretty charming looking man. So it makes sense to just kind of to bring him on as an ambassador. So <laughs> good, uh, good find sleep score. <laughs> yeah. And our last update comes from Ember Wave. They are, uh, they produce a cooling, warming wristband, which was uh, actually created based on res research from MIT. They've been around for a little while, but they recently released a new mode called 30 Minute Extended Mode. So basically, um, it does the, the mode does the same thing it has before. So it warms or cools one spot on your body. Um, and in this case, I, I believe it just fits on your wrist. So it, um, warms or cools your wrist without changing your core body temperature. It's very similar to like holding a warm cup of coffee in a cold, on a cold day or putting a cold can of soda on your neck on a scorching hot day. Uh, but the new mode in this case, um, it um, does this for an extended period of time and automates the switching between cooling and warming uh, for 30 minutes. And it gives you the option of various cooling and warming sessions. So I... From what I understand, you can like sort of tailor that to however you want um, for 30 minutes, which is which is kind of the extended part of the of the update. Um, so it's all about comfort, um, and it's uh, can be found at emberlabs.com for three hundred dollars, and it's only available in the U.S. and Canada. Um, and I went on their website, and it seems like they're selling really fast. So oh my god, I actually <laughs> need one of these. I'm so sweaty all the time. <laughs> I know I'm not an athlete or anything, but I could totally use this. I don't think you need to be one. Everyone, everyone sweats and everyone is cold <laughs> at some point or another. So although three hundred dollars, a little, a little much. It is, it is a little pricey. So yeah. Yeah. we'll have to see about that. Mm -hmm. And now moving on to our concussion update, our first piece of news comes from the NCAA, which settled a lawsuit last week with the family of a former University of Texas football player. Uh, that family accused the organization of being responsible for his brain injuries and death decades after his playing career. Uh, the uh, plaintiff, Deborah Hardin -Plo Ploetz, I hope I'm saying that name right, or Pletz, uh, wife of Greg Pletz, who died in 2015 due to an extensive brain trauma he sustained while playing football. Um, so that's where this is all stemming from. Uh, Greg did not play professionally, but graduated in 1972, earned a master's degree, and became a teacher. And uh, Deborah sued the NCAA for negligence and wrongful death, claiming that the repetitive head trauma during his college career contributed to his health problems, and uh, she she sought more than one million dollars in damages. So that has now been settled. Yeah, I'm pretty sure like they heard testimonies from some of the the guy's teammates and and his family and stuff and they didn't even go any further. Like that was it. <laughs> that was the court case. Yeah. They heard all of these testimonies, realized how 
damning they all were and then immediately settled so looking at the nhl and the I, nfl <laughs> i think everyone's got a lot coming to them yeah it, and that's the thing is like you don't have to look too hard and into these cases like once you once you look at the head trauma specifically it's it's so simple mm-hmm. to like tie it to the source and like discover oh like <laughs> head trauma is a thing and and playing a contact sport and not like knowing about the after effects of such a thing and just simply not being educated about all this and mm-hmm. cte is it is a dangerous thing so absolutely yeah it's uh it's crazy so i hope this opens some eyes and turns some heads we shall see mm-hmm. and moving on to our other story helmet sensors that can detect concussions so a uh, a startup that's also been around for a little while uh, is continuing to gain some traction um, Jesse Garcia's startup, a Pennsylvania-based uh, company called uh, Tosuda uh, LLC. Uh, Tosuda LLC. <laughs> Tosuda. <laughs> yeah, very cool name. Uh, they manufacture simple head impact sensors that actually releases a red dye when uh, imp- an impact is detected. And then that actually, uh, when an impact that could cause a concussion is detected. So it's... Uh, it's been reported on a couple times in various publications. It was a finalist in last year's Stellar Startups, a contest sponsored by uh, Mass Mutual Greater Philadelphia and hosted by the Philadelphia Inquirer, the newspaper. Um, and this event sponsors uh, or spot, puts a spotlight on startups in that area. So uh, this company is now part of that uh, event again. And it's gaining traction, like I said, among a lot of coaches. So a lot of the direct sales right now, according to these stories, are to coaches from high school teams or colleges. Um, and it's, it, I think it's really important. Uh, I thought it was worth mentioning because um, while the sensors don't diagnose the concussions that are happening, they do indicate when someone should be tested for them. And like that, that's huge. So as soon as that red dye you know you see that red dye it means okay you like need to get tested there's Mm -hmm. no question about this um and various um publications and reports are out there uh that uh, suggest that 3.8 million sports concussions a year uh take place in the u.s and only about half of them go uh and and about half of them go undetected so that's a lot of undetected concussions and this could you know really Mm -hmm. reduce that number yeah, this so, is a fantastic starting ground yeah. for any league, right? I mean, I would love to see this in the NHL. Again, we I always go back to Mark andre Fleury was hit um, this past season, was out for a couple months, but he finished that entire game before he was taken off the ice, and he very clearly had a concussion. If we had actually seen this vial, or however this helmet works, kind of break and, and spew red liquid everywhere, that might be scary enough for these people to go back and yeah. actually test him out. Yeah, and if you look at the photos, like they're very small and compact, and more specifically, the sensors are about uh, a 1.4 inch plastic capsule uh, that contain a spring, two tiny steel balls, and a clear liquid blend and a red powder dye. And then the liquid will turn red when a potentially concussive impact is detected. And then um, it actually, it's like immediate. So within mm-hmm. milliseconds of the impact, the red dye will be produced. So that's yeah, a pretty neat idea. Yeah, and it's I been, like it. it's in, it's been, like I said, circulated for a little while, but it's gaining traction more and more. And I think it's a great little, uh, great little story. Yeah, go Tozuda. Yeah. <laughs> All righty. Now on to our discussion segment of the week. Mandy got a chance to speak with Trisha Dugan, the vice president and head of immersive computing at HP, about how 3D printing can change the sports clothing industry. HP has been working on a platform called HP FitStation that's been used by some shoe manufacturers like Brooks to customize and 3D print shoes. So, of course, we chatted with her about that and some of its wider applications. Let's hear what she has to say. Why don't we get right into it? Um, Do you want to start off by telling me a little bit more about the FitStation technology? Uh, Because I believe it utilizes 3D printing. Yeah, so uh, so let me tell you a little bit about the platform. We'll talk about we talk about it as a platform because uh, FitStation is truly a platform that integrates um, multiple entities. Um, of course, there's the uh, the kiosk and the hardware solution that brings it to to life in terms of measurement, uh, biometric capability, um, uh, and a 3D capture of your foot. Um, so it takes into account all the things that HP does very well today, and we've built a deep learning around 3D as an example. 
um, not just in printing, but also in scanning. And it takes all of that, those pieces of hardware and puts them together in a way that collects and outputs biometric data that you can do many, many things with. Um, why I call it a platform is that uh, there's multiple entities in that platform. So you've got brands, you've got the manufacturing equipment, you've got suppliers, um, and you could take that and extend it farther farther uh, through the value chain. Uh, so what the fixed station platform does is it allows a person to um, come in, get some real data measurements, biometrics based on pressure plate also 3D scan of their foot, and the output of it can be several things. Um, today, uh, we actually have 25 stores that are in the United States uh, where we um, have the solution up and running. These are specialty running stores. In those specialty running stores, what you can do is you can uh, get some, uh, you can get some footwear recommendation. Um, you could also uh, get um, insole recommendation. So based on insoles that are in the store, uh, you can also get um, use the data to make uh, have 3D printed insoles printed on our multi-jet fusion technology uh, shipped directly to your home. And the future um, is around the personalized running shoe uh, with the partnership with Brooks, which is a great example of. Uh, so that's the, what essentially what the platform is is doing today. Uh, we do have these 25 stores uh, that are up and running. They've been up and running for, for many months. And um, our partnership with Superfeed has allowed us to bring those to market uh, fairly quickly. And uh, that partnership's a, a very deep partnership with Superfeed as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so why partner specifically with Superfeed and uh, Brooks for this? Are you working with any other companies as well? So, yeah, so um, so number one, uh, we are partnering with Superfeet uh, and with Brooks um, out of the gate. Um, they are great partners when it comes to the people. If you think about the end user, the customer, and what, what we're really trying to deliver here is a solution for the end customer and um, and do that in a way that's very personalized to them. And if you kind of work that back, the place to start is in a space where personalization and customization is the most important and key. And that is uh, oftentimes, and uh, with a partner like Brooks, it, it is their story. It is their running shoe. It's all the biometric, all the data that they've collected over many, many years. They're what I call their secret sauce. is all around making the shoe perfect for their runners. Um, what they're trying to do is do that in a mass market today, uh, but in the future with a platform like FitStation and the technology behind it, they can make that, um, they can take uh, a custom shoe made for a person and do it in a mass market uh, supply chain way without uh, it resulting in a shoe that doesn't fit that person. Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. And, yeah, you touched on looking forward, looking into the future. So I wanted to ask a couple questions about that as well, because 3D printing it could actually revolutionize uh, the apparel industry and the, the entire supply chain sector. So how do you think that that will happen, and or how would this customization really not only change the shoe industry but the sports apparel industry as a whole? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, I think there's a, a I think there's a lot of ways 3D printing is going to revolu revolutionize the future, right? We call it the fourth industrial revolution that will happen um, in in time with the technology as it's coming, right? Um, so I think there's many many ways that that will uh, transpire. Uh, one example that I'm thinking of that's top of mind is um, let's use Brooks. Uh, today, if you think about the supply chain and mass market and all the, the tooling required uh, and all the dollars behind that tooling to make uh, the mold for each shoe and each size of each shoe, um, when you go to customization or personalization, that just gets exponential, right? So mm -hmm. if you have to make, if, there, if you've got one shoe, one model, and you make 10 sizes, uh, then you're going to need, you know, 10 molds times that shoe to manufacture it for mass. Well, let's fast forward to the customization, personalization period, where that shoe is made 
for you, for Mandy. Mm -hmm. If that shoe is made for Mandy, then if there's one for Mandy, one for Trisha, and one for Rachel, uh, and then you continue to expand that out, you end up having to create a whole bunch of molds. So uh, with the uh, 3D print technology, uh, what that does is it allows you to very uh, inexpensively and quickly create those molds to almost a disposable, uh, and it, it can be re, um, it can be filtered and redone very quickly. Uh, in the world that we live in today, those molds are very, very expensive. So anytime the, a shoe company like a Brooks is going off and doing uh, doing that kind of work, they're incurring a cost um, for a set of molds that they're going to sell a mass amount of shoes against. Uh, but in the world of personalization and customization, you need the flexibility of 3D print to deliver that kind of solution to the to the world at the end of the day in mass. Mm -hmm. Okay, but what sort of challenges might pop up in in really using this on a mass scale? Are there any that you can think of? Uh, any challenges at a mass scale? Mm -hmm. Challenges at a mass scale? Uh, nothing. Nah, there's nothing that I can think of right now with challenges at a mass scale. Nothing that's coming to my mind. Uh, I'm sure that there's some that exist, but um, for me right now, nothing that's that jumps right out at me in this technology space. No problem. And do you see any other applications with 3D printing uh, shoes and different apparel, specifically maybe in the sports world? Like maybe we could see 3D printed hockey skates. Is that a possibility? Um, you know, I uh, I don't have the vision of the of what our what our brands and um, <laughs> and partners will do with the 3D technology as it gets more developed and more materials come to life. Um, so I, I can't I I can't surmise um, what might be 3D printed at a consumer goods level. Um, the, the example that I think will come the quickest is the one that I, what I, that I just indicated, which is, um, the mold and what's behind the scenes in creating the consumer goods. Um, uh, that one will come to life the most quickly. Um, mm -hmm. but yes, I am sure in the future we will see some 3D printed consumer goods. I just don't know what those are and our brands really are the ones who should, um, you know, who should be, who should be advising the future of what those goods could look like. No problem. Well, I think those were all of my questions. Was there anything else that you wanted to say about HP Fit Station uh, or any of the technology behind it before we go? Uh, I I think the only thing that um, that I'd love to you know just just hit home is that um, I think of this slogan, and this is something that um, that HP HP has uh, used for a while. It's using technology to make life better for everyone everywhere. And uh, what we're really focused on is making uh, life better for the people, uh, the people that are uh, not only in the sports industry, but also, um, you know, me, you, your mom, your grandma, your grandfather. Um, you know, if you think about, um, if you think about footwear, and that's where we're starting with this, that's the topic of the day with FitStation, um, you know, everybody has two feet. And uh, there's a lot of challenges out there right now. A lot of folks are going through a lot of uh, pain that starts with feet and moves through their bodies. And there's something we can do about it. And um, so I'm, I'm really excited that uh, HP is um, uh, pulling together these technologies, pulling together this platform, working with some tremendous apart partners across the value chain to really deliver a better experience uh, to people and around the globe at the end of the day. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Trisha. I really appreciate this. It was very insightful. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, that's it for today's episode. Thanks to everyone who listened to us. We really appreciate it. It's been uh, 49 episodes, which is incredible. And uh, we have a really good one coming up next week. Episode 50 is going to be extra special. So definitely stay tuned. Yeah. And just a reminder that we're also now in a daily format as well. If you'd rather listen to us that way, you can follow us on Twitter at ITB Tech and Sports or our personal accounts at Mandy V. Kovacs. And it's just Alex Coop. So once again, thank you, everyone. We appreciate it. Thank <laughs> you.